Thank you, Mr. Mathur, for your thoughts. And uh, I definitely agree with one point what he just professed, that if you look at the availability of coal, uh, we will, while we are pursuing and working towards the renewables in order to improve the environment, but looking to the usage and the availability, coal and fossil fuels are going to live for a longer duration and longer period with the best of things. There have been very pointed out comments which have been made by Mr. Mathur in terms of how we can improve the quality of emission or emitting of CO2 or how it can reduce it to the best use by introduction of retrofitting and other uses, talking about what the just now the, our Prime Minister has talked about UCG and also <clears throat> the improvement and the investment that the people have to do in terms of making, because there will be tremendous pressure on the, as far as the power is concerned, when we are also having e-mobility. And we do not want that the consumption centers of emitting CO2 may shift to the producing or the therm uh, generating centers unless the improvement takes place in terms of the power generating companies. So very useful thoughts have been given by Mr. Mathur. And uh, with these thoughts having presented by all of us talking about the policy, talking about the solar use, talking about the three main points touched by Mr. Kumar in terms of research organizations to scale up renewable. Number second is the renewable policy has to be more focused and also generating demand. The public awareness has to come irrespective of the price that whether even if it is higher price, but as long as it is beneficial, people should look forward or come forward to support those issues. And finally, by Mr. Mathur about the coal. With this presentation, I'll turn to our <clears throat> next panelist, which is who is a very eminent panelist, Mr. Mike McCurdy, who is the Managing Director of Energy Advisory Services. I would like Mr. Mike McCurdy to give, share his thoughts how does he look at the whole presentation that has been given by the various panelists and talked about? And what, in his opinion, is the best way to move forward? And if we have missed out on a few things, I'm sure we will be benefited by his advice. So over to you, Mike, for your comments. Thank you very much for the, uh, uh, the nice introduction and the explanation of the recent changes in the Indian energy industry. It's been very enlightening. And I'd like to also thank Dr. Garg and the World Future Fuel Summit for uh, having us, having me here to speak. Um, we appreciate the invitation and uh, it's, it's been a very educational experience for me. Um, it just sitting through presentations in the last few days, it's really exciting to see what the, the nation of India is is how it's moving its, its energy systems into being more sustainable and more reliable and more secure uh, through the use of all the different fuels and uh, in indigenization of, of different technologies and, and using its resources and everything like that. Um, you know, I, I do look at uh, one of the key challenges going forward uh, with the renewable energy systems is the, the financing of, of the small projects. Um, it, it's somewhat counterintuitive, but what, what we've seen in, uh, in the United States with, with solar and, and now the smaller uh, uh, renewable natural gas systems is that the, uh, the bankers in US and Europe, they, they really don't get excited until the project cost gets, gets up to about Sorry, I'll uh, speak into the microphone a little better. Um, yeah, so they, they don't get excited until the project cost gets, 
gets about $30 million. And um, the, the larger the project, the more interest you get from the, uh, the financial institutions. And the, uh, the very large financial institutions, the, uh, the bond houses and the, uh, the insurance companies, institutional investors, will provide very attractive financing rates for projects. They'll, they'll provide financing rates in the, the four to six percent. Whereas if you get start getting smaller, the investment banks will be somewhere between eight and 12 percent. Um, and then MESDET and, and other uh, development debt from equity type partners is up in 16 or 16, 18 percent interest rate. So what, um, what's going on in the, the United States is that uh, these renewable natural gas uh, developers are making portfolios of projects uh, so they can finance 10, 15, 30 projects in a row or at one time, rather, uh, one, one, two, or three projects. And so what, uh, basically, they're, they're following the same path that uh, commercial and industrial solar did. Um, most of the commercial and industrial solar projects were about $1 million in, in uh, value. So what they had done is they, they put portfolios of 75, 100, or, or 200, uh, little uh, one one million dollar projects into one large project, so I think this might be a, a a path forward for India when you're looking at these uh, small renewable natural gas systems because uh, as Mr. Patan noted earlier, going from two or three up to uh, five thousand in the next decade, you really have to f figure out how to uh, uh, to, to provide financing for that many projects. And, uh, yeah, and th then really the next thing I was looking at is uh, the challenge of the feedstock systems for these, these new renewable energy systems. Um, the, uh, the sustainable aviation fuel renewable jet facilities that um, they, they put at refineries um, most, I'm most familiar with a couple of technologies. There's one uh, UOP in, uh, uh, in the States, in Halder Topso in Europe, and the, the IITs have hydro-treating technologies as well. But these, uh, these technologies are, are consume a lot of feedstock. Um, the standard, uh, standard size is, is 6,500 barrels per day uh, unit operations at these refineries. Now, so that, that translates to about 400 million liters of used cooking oil going into that refinery per year. And um, at least in the, the United States, we produce about four kilograms of used cooking oil per person. So um, you know, it, the aggregation of all that material and getting it to a refinery is, is, a, is a big challenge. Um, it, it can be done and uh, you know, I think India has a probably a, a very unique capability to to, to aggregate all this material. Um, you know, the the small logistics systems in the country are very very impressive, and um, you know, going forward, I think that you'll see a lot of opportunities for uh, logistics and, and collections and, and a lot of employment through these uh, uh, sustainable aviation fuel projects that probably be looking at it, uh, Indian Oil and, and Reliance and, and other, uh, other big refinery producers. And then uh, the last real opportunity I see is, um, is the opportunity for this renewable natural gas methane. Um, you know, it, these projects, uh, once again, are, are smaller, but in, in ag when you have enough of them, it really makes a big difference. You know, um, looking at the, the opportunity for India, the, the 15, 20, 25 percent offset of all the imported natural gas, those are, those are real numbers. You know, the, the technologies here, um, they, they need to implement the, the policies and the, uh, the changes, but uh, that India can, can really reduce its import bill by executing these projects and then um, 
between the, the methane production at the renewable natural gas systems, uh, power to gas at the, uh, uh, the solar systems, and, and then you can start using that fuel to augment um, coal and other, other baseload power uh, to, to stabilize the grid and make everything more, uh, more sustainable. And I think that's really a, it's another tremendous opportunity and I'm really excited to see how India is moving, moving towards that, uh, in that direction to really provide uh, energy, secure energy to India um, with a, a stable grid and, and employment opportunities for uh, a significant number of, of people. Thank you.